Well, thank you for having me. I am, my name is Sarah Newman. I am from Boston, Massachusetts, and I work with a group called MetaLab at Harvard. Um, so Harvard has a number of research groups that are committed to interdisciplinary study, and I work with two of them. One is called MetaLab, and that is a group that brings together artists, technologists, and humanities scholars to do interdisciplinary projects that sort of research network culture, but through art, through teaching, through um, various kind of hacks, um, workshops, that kind of thing. It's, it's really interesting, uh, always making new projects. So I'm here with my colleagues from MetaLab. And then I also am a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And the Berkman Klein Center is committed to studying uh, the internet and its effects on society. And so my work sort of brings research of the internet and culture, um, my background in philosophy, and my uh, background in work as an artist all together. And that's what I'm doing here. There's a lot of ways that it influences us constantly, both when we're on and offline. Um, in my specific work, um, I'm working on this research project called the, the Future of Secrets. And it's a, I've been working on it for about two years um, in collaboration with some colleagues at the Berkman Klein Center. And it's a research project about what happens to our digital correspondence in the long-term future. So right now, our private digital correspondence, so emails, text messages, um, not so much on a large scale of collecting metadata, you know, what we're buying and, you know, for advertisers or corporate interests, but things more like love letters um, and other sort of private things about us that maybe aren't meant for public view. Um, in the past, people had a lot more control of analog content. You know, you can destroy things, for example. With digital correspondence, it's much harder to delete. It's much harder to control unless you own your own server, for example, as we saw in the recent presidential election in the US. Um, so uh, I've been interested in this kind of from a philosophical standpoint, um, because on a large scale, I feel like having, everybody has skeletons in their closet. I'm not sure the best way to translate that, but a lot of people have private lives and different forms of identity that express in a, a digital space. And if you think about 100 years from now, whether, for example, will our great-grandchildren be able to read our emails? Um, ought they be allowed to? Is it ethical? Um, do, how do we feel about that now? And what can we learn about ourselves by how we respond to our own secrets now? So that's the research project. So it started as a research project, um, working with lawyers, scholars, academics, doing interviews, thinking about it from the social science perspective, thinking about ways in which the digital is different in some ways and the same in some ways as, for example, letters from the past, um, but especially the ways in which it's different. And, and the main way um, to me that it's different is that um, it's distributed in, a, in sort of unknown and unexpected ways. There's, there's multiple copies. You know, when you send an email, it doesn't just exist for you anymore. It, you know, whoever you sent it to has a copy. Google has multiple copies on multiple servers. So that's one way. And then the other way is that we use it so much. We use it so impulsively. We use it like conversation. We don't use it like letters. Um, and so a lot of times there's things that you've said and taken out of context, they mean something completely different. So if you collapse somebody's archive of writing in digital form and, and, and you know, use an algorithm to scrape it for like juice, juicy content, that's not necessarily an accurate portrait of of who that person is or was. I mean, I'm not the same person now than I was when I was 20, and you could pull things from my correspondence then that wouldn't represent me. And somehow digital space collapses time. It doesn't um, sort of represent time as a, a longer continuum. So that's, that's one concern, is what, ha what actually happens in the future. And then on a large scale, how does that affect culture? So if everybody learns things, and once you learn something, as we know, you can't unlearn it. So if everybody learns things about their great-grandparents that are dark and maybe inaccurate, and that happens to everybody individually, what happens to us as a culture as a result? So that's one question. And then the other question is, how do I express that through, that's one research question, then it's how do I express that through art, right? Or how do I investigate that through my artwork? Because that's my medium of communication. Um, I do writing also, but um, for a work like this, I feel like art is a better medium, it's a more interesting medium for provoking ideas and accessing a, a broader public. Should I continue? Should I just go on? Okay. So, um, th th that's what the research question started as. And then, 
I thought, okay, through interviews and through a lot of work with social social science methods and sort of alternative social science methods, like interviews that are kind of rhetorical and almost like performance based in the sense that they're basically tricking people into realizing that they have double standards for themselves and for their the people in the future. Um, I realized that I could do it, bring it to the present and think, what, what relationship do we have now to our secrets? Um, not only in a speculative version of the future, but in the, in the present. So I designed an installation with uh, Jessica Yurkovsky, um, who's a creative technologist at MetaLab, and Matthew Bat Battles, who's also at MetaLab. And the, the project essentially is it's very simple in its form, but it's very provocative in what it does. And the, the installation, this version of the installation itself is called The Presence of Secrets. So the Future of Secrets is the large research project. And then I have these various creative outputs that are artistic projects, and they have different names. Um, so th this one that I'm speaking about is called The Presence of Secrets. I have a sound version of it that's going up in Rome in a couple weeks, and that's called Nobody's Listening. Um, and so for The Presence of Secrets, it's uh, basically a computer screen and a keyboard on a pedestal. Uh, the first place we showed it was the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. This is our second time showing it here at Republica. And uh, the screen says, do you have a secret? Type it here. Super simple, super straightforward. Uh, beside the printer, uh, beside the screen is a small uh, receipt printer. And type a secret. If you decide to participate, type a secret. You hit enter. And when you hit enter, the printer goes off and it prints somebody else's secret which then you can take with you. People don't know what's going to happen, so there's a lot of surprise. I mean, I don't know why it's quite so surprising, but it seems like people are shocked. Because once they see somebody else's secret, not only are they shocked by whatever they may read, but they also have to contend with the, the fact that they just put their secret into a database that somebody else is going to receive. So that's what's happening at the main station. And then we set up remote stations, which only have printers. Um, and the printers just print secrets at random intervals for people to discover. So you can discover, so, you, so the way we had it in Boston and the way we have it here too is on different floors. So sometimes you just walk up to this printer that's just spewing out secrets. Um, and you can have that experience. Or you can find the station where you can submit secrets. Um, a number of unexpected things happened. One is that I, we expected a number of things from the piece, but we didn't expect it to produce a lot of joy, and it does. People are really happy when they... And you can have different theories about why this could be, but there, there seems to just be a lot of joy and a lot of laughter, even though the secrets are pretty dark. So whether it's by giving something away or discovering something about somebody else, whether it's a sense of sort of play and experimentation and release, that was one thing we were surprised by, because people found the station, they were surprised, sometimes a little worried, but then continue to come back and bring their friends. And there was a long queue in Boston that formed to put your secrets in, you know? So there was this sense of like wanting to participate. And I feel like there's an interesting parallel there to what's happening in our digital lives. Like we have all this knowledge and awareness of, you know, being surveilled, of people collecting our data. And yet we still participate more and more and more and give more and more away. So. It's, it's complicated. It's not as, like, you know, our actions are guided by a lot of different sort of desires and not always by some top level rational reasoning. And the piece kind of brought that out. Um, another thing that came out that is actually kind of pushing the piece in a new direction related to artificial intelligence and our human relationships with machines, um, which is another area of work I'm moving into uh, in collaboration with the Berkman Klein Center. And that is the logics that people project onto a very simple mechanism the sorts of intelligence they read from it. Uh, so the piece is not that sophisticated. It's a little bit more sophisticated than I mentioned because there's some other things that happen. For example, sometimes a picture prints, and it's a picture of somebody putting in a secret. Some, uh, sometimes that happens. And that triggers a whole other sense of I'm being watched. Who's watching me? Is the computer watching me? Is other people, are other people watching me? That happens periodically. So there's a surveillance dimension. Another logic that the machine has is sometimes it doesn't give you a secret. Sometimes it asks you a question about your secret. So there's like, so it's dialogical, very simply dialogical. And then sometimes it prints a secret that's related to your secret. So there's, there's low levels of intelligence that we program it into it. It's not super sophisticated, but people have all sorts of stories about what's happening. 
which is really interesting to observe. Uh, so that's made me push the piece more into having some level of low intelligence, but basically wanting to draw out from humans how much we project onto machines. And that's, I think, really important right now as we are bringing more and more of them into our lives, as conversations about AI are all over the board, you know, from like the really dark apoc apocalyptic to like the really hopeful to everything in between. Um, sort of recognizing the human role in, in, in the, the sense we make of these things is really essential. And so that piece, this piece is starting to do that. Um, and then in, in terms of going back to the present, the last thing that's kind of come up as sort of a meaningful experience is, is that in addition to, you know, 100 years out or beyond, and like how we maybe want to um, sort of activate concern about protecting ourselves now, and there's plenty of ways to do that. Um, it's also like a moment of existential reflection to be asked point blank about your secrets. So while most people would admit or most people acknowledge or believe that they have secrets, most people aren't usually asked so explicitly what those secrets are. So even in a big you know, art context and even in something very playful or social where there's a lot of levity and a lot of delight, there's something that's much um, more introspective about being asked to share, whether you share it or not, even just being asked what your secrets are puts people in a very reflective place. And some feedback that I've gotten about the piece is how it kept people thinking. Um, and, and I really like that. And um, in terms of the, the, returning to the other question about, you know, why art? And, you know, I mentioned that I, I like to art. I feel like a lot of people have a lot of wisdom and you don't have to be a researcher or an expert in a field to have insight because we're all humans and that's kind of what the work is about. And so opening it up to a wider audience, I found that this type of feedback I've gotten about what at least people thinking about, people have really insightful, people from all fields and all levels of education have, have really insightful feedback about the experiences they're having that have really contributed to the piece. And so while I'm at you know, a wonderful university and there's, I'm surrounded by amazing scholars, there's also something really rewarding and really insightful about working with general public and, and bringing their feedback into the piece um, and making that a part of it too. I think that some people are aware that they're playing a different role in a digital space. But I don't, and especially in extreme cases where people have pseudonyms, alter egos, that go online specifically to be anonymous or pseudonymous so that they can enact or explore part of their part of this persona. However, I think that the medium, the sort of the digital medium itself is insidious in a way that it, and not in only a bad, not in a bad way necessarily, but in a, a very quiet and subtle way, I think the medium itself affects the way people express. And so I think that happens on a very wide scale. And I think many people are not aware of the way that it's affecting them. I think many people chat, they might acknowledge it once you ask them specific questions. Like, is the voice you use when you chat with somebody in, you know, in, in Gchat the same as the voice you use when you speak? You ask them that, they'll say, probably not. You know, if you ask them like little questions, you could probably lead them to acknowledge. But if you just said, oh, are you a different person? I'm like, oh no, it's me, and it's the same person, I'm me. But I really think the medium itself brings out these different parts of us. I don't think that's bad at all. I mean, I think that's the true, true of any sort of creative or expressive technology. Like, the way I use a camera and make photographs is different than the way I would use a pen and make a drawing, you know? Um, and sometimes the technology is more um, upfront about the fact that it's, you know, mediating the person that you're expressing. And sometimes it's, it's really subtle, which is what I mean by insidious. You know, it, it kind of becomes invisible. You, forget, you, you stop seeing the fact that there's something mediating your identity. But I also think that there's something really positive in that it, it's really a safer place for a lot of forms of exploration and expression that are not as comfortable in, in the human. So it's not like, oh, we shouldn't do this, or you know, we're only our true selves in physical space. I don't think that's true at all. I think we have endless possibilities to explore in all sorts of creative or altered environments. Um, but I think in terms of people's awareness, it's a range, and I also think it depends on how you would ask. In terms of people's relationships uh, to their secrets, there's, there's a huge range. I've kind of mapped it, I've, I, because as I've mentioned, I've done these different sorts of workshops and interviews. So 
I, I break them into camps, okay? Uh, there's people who have secrets that they want, that there are secrets now that they want to stay forever secrets. There's people that have secrets now that at some point in the future, there's a threshold after which you cross. It's okay that it's not a secret forever, it's a secret for now. That time period maybe has to do with the, their, their lifetime or the lifetime of anybody who knows them. Or even it could be much shorter, like it could be, it's a secret now, but it won't be a secret in three years. If, you know, if it's somebody's around somebody's identity or something that's transitioning about somebody's identity. So there's different time ranges, and th those are specific. So there's the secrets forever to be secrets. There's secrets um, after which a certain time they're no longer secrets. Um, there's a kind of a subcategory of that, which has to do with geographical space as opposed to temporal space. So then there's secrets. I still call it part of that category. So there's secrets that are secrets now and here but maybe aren't secrets for somebody that's so far away that it's a different kind of distance, like a geographical distance. Like, okay, you don't want people in your community to know this or people in your country or people who speak your language to know this, but to somebody that's on the other side of the world that you'll never meet and will, you know, do you care if they know it? And some of those people say, I don't really care if they know it. You know, so there's these different kind of distances, but they're secrets with, with a parameter. Um, then there's secrets that people don't want to be secrets. So they, they call them secrets, they identify them as secrets, but they actually wish for them to not be secrets, either, either now or in the future. Um, and a lot of it is, is for now. Like, yes, this is a secret, but I, I really wish it, it, it wasn't a secret. Now, there's interesting questions around that, like, well then, why is, you know, why is it a secret? But then there's actually, in some cases, a wish for it to come out in the future. I think some people hope that their secrets, their current secrets are discovered, again, with a certain temporal dimension, you know. They, they hope that their children will one day know about their past lover, or they hope that their great-grandchildren will appreciate the fact that they were, you know, a repressed homosexual, or whatever. You know, there's a million different kinds, you know, of secrets. So, so that would be the last, is the people who, who, who hope that their secrets come out now or later. So I think that the installation intrigues these different groups of people in different ways, not all in the same way. Um, in terms of the, the, the platforms that you mentioned, the, the you know, Whisper or Snapchat or things that are meant to disappear, I think that it, it gives people um, sort of space to explore what it means to share, but within a potentially protected environment and also within a space where it's okay to be talking about who's going to see it. Because those platforms not only introduced temporality and disappearance and, and privacy of a certain kind, uh, but also the fact that, okay, let's have open dialogue about making things disappear as opposed to, to staying around. So I think that that's what those did. I, I do think that we're in a time right now that's a strange in-between time where the technologies and their convenience has caught on so quickly that we're using them, um, and we're using them so, so much, and our criticality of them is kind of lagging behind. Like, we're starting to catch up now. Um, and that, that ha happens too, of course, with like all sorts of innovations, which is why, you know, there's these wonderful drugs that are discovered, and then you realize like 10 years later that it actually has lead in it, or whatever, you know, whatever the thing may be. It's like, oh, this thing is so great. Oh, wait, maybe it's not. And that happens, like you know, from the industrial revolution to the present day. Same thing is happening in this sort of digital, the digital, digital space with our digital technology. So I think now there's really a big movement, um, and I think that that movement has really brought in these these new apps that have this kind of disappearing quality. Um, sometimes things go become kind of dark as a result of that, and that has happened with Whisper. And there's you know, once things become anonymous, there's also opportunities for trolling, uh, bullying, cyberbullying, um, and it, it gives space and, and freedom for kind of darker parts of, of people that aren't necessarily healthy or healthy to share with others to come out as well. So there's, it's kind of a balance between the liberty of expression and um, not wanting to feed or create space for, for hatred. I'm an artist, I identify as an artist. But my like, deepest interest is actually in human psychology. Uh, so I feel like what I do is I, I really like beauty and I like making beautiful things. And I like making intriguing things. But I feel like I'm always 
confusing those things with the dimension of either self-understanding and reflection or, um, you know, sort of broader understanding and reflection. It's not exactly a secret, but it is um, enough. And that's not what you wanted necessarily was a secret, but it is, um, it does sort of infuse and feed and, and propel my work. Uh, and I think that allowing sort of researchers more opportunities to do art and creative projects, because I'm also a researcher, or allowing sort of artists really more into the academic space is something I'm a huge proponent of, and thankfully something that the institution I'm at allows me to do and supports me in doing. Um, so I would say I, I come from a, like a pretty diverse and interesting background. Um, I'm a pretty diverse and complicated person, and, then, and so my interest is in human psychology generally, but also in sort of taking the questions that fuel me and um, sort of bringing them into a wider audience for, for dialogue and, and reflection. <laughs> yeah, so one of the, um, in terms of sort of happiness, there's this, I, I reference Nietzsche a lot, um, you know, German philosopher, uh, who uh, wrote an essay called, I don't know the German, the, 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 it was written in German, of course, but I don't know the German pronunciation of the title, but the English translation is uh, The Advantage and Disadvantage of History for Life or the use and abuse of history for life. It's also been translated as that. And uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to summarize. It's a beautiful essay. It's very short. I highly recommend it. Um, it's interesting. It was written in 1874. It's so relevant today, um, especially with this work. Uh, but it's basically about memory and history and how some amounts of history and memory are really productive and useful and can be really inspiring. But too much memory and history can be really stifling and really problematic. Um, and it's a really uniquely human experience, this form of, of historiography, telling stories about our past. You know, you look at other animals, they don't have a culture of telling stories about their past. And so finding some balance of, of sort of memory and forgetting is a, is a really essential thing in terms of, you know, happiness or kind of states of, states of being that we would consider like the, the highest level of flourishing. And so that was a reference that you, you mentioned.